Good morning. I'm going to talk to you today about going beyond four square blocks. Four square blocks is something that uh, brings to mind a lot of things for a lot of people. What that means for you, only you know, because my four square blocks pretty much probably will not resemble your four square blocks. The four square blocks that I was subjected to, although geographically real, pretty much just existed in my mind. And this is basically my story, how my perspective was skewed and later was changed. So what we're going on is a journey, a transformation that hopefully will end in a change in perspective. My story starts here. Now this is a city many of you are familiar with, yes? yes. This is Chicago, the Chicago that most people know. And Chicago's famous for a lot of things. Chicago's famous for its pizza, for its hot dog. You got Chicago blues. It's a city of icons. And these are some of the icons that uh, I identified with and, and were impactful in my life. Some of you may recognize these folks. These were all people associated with the city of Chicago. These are some more of my icons. Some of you don't know these guys, but with names like Scarface, Momo, and Big Tuna, how can I not be attracted to this stuff growing up? Chicago is also famous for one other thing that some of you may not be aware of. And this starts with a number. The number is 100,000. 100,000 gang members in Chicago. 100,000 gang members to 15,000 police department personnel, 13,000 of which are actual cops. Now again, my story is telling you how I was subjected to living within these four square blocks while I dreamt about getting away from that and the reasons why I dreamt. In 1889, Kipling wrote, I have struck a city, a real city, and they call it Chicago. I urgently desire never to see it again. It is inhabited by savages. 25 years later, Sandberg wrote this, hog butcher for the world, tool maker, stacker of wheat, player with railroads and the nation's freight handle, stormy, husky, brawling, city of the big shoulders. They tell me you are wicked, and I believe them. For I have seen your painted women under the gas lamps luring the farm boys. And they tell me you are crooked, and I answer, yes, it is true. I have seen the gunmen kill and go free to kill again. Once again, this is Chicago. The Chicago that you know. Many of you know this. Shopping, shows, beautiful skyline. Like any big city, it is kind of broken up into neighborhoods. That's my neighborhood right there, the South Lawndale area. If anybody's familiar with Cook County Courthouse or Cook County Jail, I was born and raised three blocks from there. Now, I was subjected to my environment. And a neighborhood, most neighborhoods provide everything that you need. It provides your mom and pop grocery store. It provides your church, your school, a doctor's office, liquor store, four or five blocks. I believe there was six bars in four or five blocks. That's a lot of watering holes in a small area. And all of those things, those ingredients that a neighborhood can provide for, provide one thing, complacency. And that's programming. Much like a reservation, people who live in ghettos are subjected to living in ghettos. They are programmed to stay in the ghetto because you have everything that you need right there. Why would you possibly have to leave? This was the programming I was subjected to. And it wasn't because I didn't have good parents. My parents were there. My parents worked. They were old school. They thought that if I provide for my child and I encourage him to get up and go to school every day, he'll be all right. I was one of those kids that was cared for and, and neglected at the same time. Cared for and neglected at the same time. That's a concept that's kind of hard to wrap your mind around. But in my house, there was always music playing. In my house, there was always access to the TV because I could go to the TV anytime I wanted. No one was putting any kind of limits on me. 
This is the Chicago that I know. This is what you would call a ghetto. Today it's referred to as the hood. The Windy City, Chi Town, the Chi, or as it's now called, Chirac. Hopefully it won't be called Sharia anytime soon. This is the Chicago that I know. How many of you know this Chicago? How many of you are subjected to this type of environment every day of your life from the time you're born? That's programming. If you walk into a store in an affluent neighborhood, you might see a sign out front that says grocery. But in ghettos all across the nation, what you see is signs that say liquor, beer, wine, and then groceries, food stamps, etc. What it's telling you is get drunk and stay here. You don't have to leave your neighborhood. That's programming. Now, I grew up in the 70s. And the 70s were a magical time, and because I had access to TV, I could watch all kinds of things, and there were a lot of reruns, because this was before cable. So my first mentors were Morgan Freeman and Bill Cosby and Rita Moreno, and they were talking about reading. Reading was important. They made a big fuss about it. I was fascinated with the Japanese culture because Japan was the land of space giants and monsters. I didn't see that in Chicago. These guys made music fun. Now, some of you here may know me. Does anybody here know me? Don't all speak up at once. <laughs> I'm an entertainer. I play in a band. And I work in human services. And this made music fun for me. I found out that these Beatles were really these Beatles. And that changed my life, believe it or not. You know why? Because the music made me listen. It made me listen in ways that I wasn't accustomed to. There was always music playing in my house, but the Beatles weren't like these guys. They weren't like Dean and Elvis and Sammy and Frank and Tom Jones or Tony Orlando. You laugh, but Tony Orlando was a very hip dude. See, in the 70s, these two guys were the two coolest Latino guys on TV, Tony Orlando and Freddie Prince, and they weren't even 100% Latino. This was my best friend in the winter months when I was a small, small child. When the weather changed in spring and summer and fall, I'd go outside and I interacted, I interacted with the people in my neighborhood. Now you guys remember a show called Sesame Street, right? Right? right. Is this an interactive audience? Am I speaking to the darkness? Or what? <laughs> now there was a song that would reoccur on that show that went, who are the people in your neighborhood? the people in your neighborhood, right? Remember that. I want you to hold on to that for a second. I watched a lot of TV, and when Fonzie got his library card, <laughs> some of you remember that episode, once again, there was an emphasis on reading. Reading is important. Why is it important? Because knowledge is power. Schoolhouse Rock taught me that. So one night, I was about eight years old, and I stayed up late, and I caught The Late Show, and it was a movie called Three Days of the Condor. And this movie, believe it or not, changed my life. Do you know why? Because the character in this movie did everything that he could do, all because he read. As a matter of fact, Cliff Robertson, one of the actors in the movie, was asked the question, how is Condor able to do this? And his reply was, he reads. He reads everything. Knowledge was power. So I read. Some of you may be familiar with these authors. These were the first books that I devoured. And I liked them, so I read them again and again and again. And of course, God bless Mr. Stan Lee, who provided an endless supply of comic books. But there was another power that I had been subjected to. There was another power that I was familiar with. It was the power of fireworks, not those fireworks, these fireworks. Now you might be thinking, why is the bicentennial thing up there? I'll tell you why. Because July 4, 1976 was the day that I witnessed my first murder. 
In the excitement of fireworks and all the screams, someone was screaming a little bit differently. And as I ran around the corner and saw a body laying there bleeding out, it struck me. That's an image that I still have engraved in here today. We would call that trauma. In the 70s, there was a lot of solidarity. There was, there was that whole wave of coming off a social revolution of the 60s and, and coming off the Vietnam War. There was a lot of this and there was a lot of this. There was a lot of ethnic pride. There was a lot of movements. And these were my people. These were my people doing these things. And I wanted to interact with these people. When I came outside, I saw these people out in my neighborhood. They wore colorful clothing. They belonged to social clubs. Remember the song? These are the people in your neighborhood. In your neighborhood. In your neighborhood. Try singing that with these guys. Now, I was young and naive and impressionable, but when I stepped outside my door, I didn't live on Sesame Street. I lived among this. <coughs> now, some of you don't understand what these, what these colors are. These are gang sweaters. And by the time I was five, I could identify gang emblems and gang sweaters and gang colors. And see, it was systematic. If you wore a light-colored sweater because you had a dark-colored counterpart, you were partying. You were not soldiering. You were out to have a good time. If you wore your dark colored sweater, you were at war. So it was easily identifiable. If you were out after dark and the street lamps went out, that meant someone was going to get shot. Those are the things that I learned in my neighborhood. We pick up things from the people that we are exposed to or the things that we are exposed to. I spent a lot of time with these guys right here. These look familiar to you, right? You reach a point in life where you wonder, how did you become who you are? The traits that we exhibit have to come from somewhere. If you grow up with smokers, you smoke. If you grow up with drinkers, you drink. If you grow up with abusers, you abuse or you get abused. So you pick up these traits like a sponge. I absorb that and I absorb this. I went to eight years of Catholic school thinking everything was going to be OK because Jesus loved me. Two to 300 students in a very small school over a church. This is my actual grade school right there. And then I went to high school here. Now, you can't see the smokestack behind the building, but this kind of looks like a factory. Three floors, one city block, 3,500 students, eight different gangs. Now it wasn't just the stuff outside my door in my neighborhood that I was subjected to. Now the neighborhood had followed me to school. Now I was in it. I was in a gang. I was in hell. And anytime an institution of learning resembles hell, we've got a problem. Because I didn't care about school. I liked history and I liked English because knowledge was power. I never forgot that. But I was concerned about getting stuck in the neck. I wasn't sure if I was going to go home at the end of the day. These are some of the quotes that my teachers said to me. These are some of the things that were said to me during my academic career. I get paid whether you learn or not. It doesn't matter to me. You're just a nigger with straight hair. The last one is my favorite one. I don't know why you bother to come to school. You're going to end up dead or in jail anyway. You know why that's my favorite one? Because that was told to me by a teacher here in Holland when I moved here. Holland, where there's a church on every corner. There has to be more to life, right? I knew there was more to life because I was living vicariously through these characters that I was reading about and the music I was listening to and the people that I was watching on TV. Someone had to experience those things in order to put it out there. So I had data. I knew what was what. I turned that into information because I knew there was something more. And then I applied some knowledge in order to change my perspective and make something different. Wisdom is something I'm still striving to achieve. But see, I learned compassion and learning. I learned compassion and love for humanity. I learned camaraderie and loyalty. I learned that you have to move forward. Learning was important. It's OK 
to fail as long as you keep trying. You know who taught me that? Jackie Gleason, the great one himself. So this is who I am. As much as I am those guys in the neighborhood, like I said, some of you know me as an entertainer. Some of you know me because I work in social and human services. Very few, if any, know me as Chicago gang member. I didn't leave the gang. I moved out of the city. I still get love from the brothers back home. We still keep in touch. I don't go stand on the corner and smoke a joint. I've outgrown that. I changed my perspective. I realized that the only limitations, the only parameters of those four square blocks were in here. I was free the whole time. I stopped drinking the Kool-Aid. You have to aspire to more than mediocrity. You have to move forward in life. And in order to do that, you need to change that perspective. Because I believe that if you change your perspective, you change your life. And if you change your life, you change the lives of the people around you. And that spreads. So now I'm going to ask you, I'm going to leave you with this question. What are your four square blocks that you need to break free from? Enjoy the rest of the day, folks. Thank you.